This morning, we're going to look at John 3, 16 uh, through verse 21. And there was a song, an old hymn that came to my mind that as I was reflecting on God giving his son and uh, what he suffered on the cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophy is at last I promise in that last verse. Then he'll call on me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. And we do look forward to that day when he calls us to be with him where his glory will forever share. That's hard to imagine on this side, but that is a promise. He was the firstborn of the resurrection and we too shall be raised from the dead. And uh, if we die before that coming, we know that Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I know on this side, death is, is not, a, uh, not a pleasant thing to contemplate, especially if it's a loved one. 
But for those who know Christ, man, it's the fulfillment of their, what they've longed for, the completion of their salvation. Oh yeah, we're saved on this side, but we'll see the fullness and completeness of our salvation when we're there with him. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, probably the most popular verse uh, known in all of the world. You see it everywhere. You see it in the end zones in football games, John 3, 16. And, but I'm, I'm afraid that there are many that, that see that and, and we quote that to others who don't realize the fullness of what that verse means. John in writing, of course, we know uh, the instance was when Nicodemus had come to Jesus and Jesus declared that you must be born again, not only born of the flesh, born bodily, but also be born of the spirit, to be reborn because we're separated from God. Our spirits are dead to him. Our spirits are dead because of the consequence of sin that we all share. We're born into sin, as the Bible tells us. And apart from uh, a new creation, having a new spirit that only God himself can do, none of us would have the hope of eternal life. And so Jesus makes the declaration in verse 16 to Nicodemus as he's speaking. He says, For God so loved the world. I stopped and contemplated on that this morning as I was reading it. And I asked the question, God, how have you so loved the world? And it's kind of mind-boggling to me that as sinful as we are in comparison to the holiness of God, that God would want to have anything to do with this. But his love for mankind is what motivated him. For God so loved the world, every created human being who's created in the image of God, God so loved us that he sent his one and only son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. God had the option of not sending his son. God had the option of, of declaring that man had rebelled against him by sinning to the desire to live their own life apart from God. But God worked out a plan all the way back in the beginning of the garden we see in Genesis chapter 3 that it would be, was prophesied that from the seed of woman would come one who would crush the head of the serpent and defeat him. And all that is entailed in him would defeat death, spiritual death, as well as physical death. And God sent his one and only son and we sometimes had the idea that Jesus didn't come into existence until the incarnation, but, but Jesus is God, very God. He has all of the attributes of, of God. When, when the world was created, Jesus was there. The Holy Spirit was there. It's that doctrine that we, that we hold to in the Trinity, that three persons, three distinct persons, all God, yet one God. And God sent his Son uh, willingly, his son was a willing participant in it. Jesus, the incarnation when he was born of the Virgin Mary. God sent his son. And when uh, Jesus says here that, that God sent his son, it's not just that he sent him in the incarnation, but he sent him so that he might fulfill all the righteous requirements that were necessary to have eternal life or eternal relationship with the holy God, that it, it tells all of his life, not just the time when he was born in the manger, but God sent his son, Jesus, God himself, God, very God, who humbled himself, Paul tells us in Philippians, though he was God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to, but he gave up certain rights that he had as God deity and, and, and became clothed in human flesh and lived a perfect, sinless life, born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, not having sin nature that all of us have as a result of being the sons of Adam, if you will. And so Jesus fulfilled all of those, that God sent his son, that he would ultimately go to the cross. And when he would be there on that cross, our sins, the Bible tells us, would be imputed, placed on Christ, and the wrath of God, the wrath of the Father would be poured out on Jesus. The wrath and punishment that we deserve for our sin, Jesus would take that on himself. I call it the great exchange, that, that Jesus took on my sin, and when I placed my trust in him, 
I took on his righteousness. And so did you, if you've placed your trust, if you believed in Jesus Christ, as Jesus says in here. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, uh, that whoever would believe in him would not perish. That word perish means to be eternally separated from God, destroyed. That we would not perish, but we would have eternal life as God had always intended it from his from the creation of man. And then verse 17, I love this verse. For God did not send his son to condemn the world. There is a time that he is going to return. He's going to come, and at that time, he will judge all unrighteousness. But he sent his son not to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. I reflected on that, and I thought, you know, if I'm a disciple of Christ, if I'm a follower of Christ, then if he did not come to condemn the world, then I certainly have no right to condemn the world either. So many times as believers, we forget that he saved us, that we were wretched. We too were once separated from God because of our sins. And we get the idea that, that we are all that, that we're holy and righteous, and we go around pointing our finger and condemning the world. What right do we have to condemn the world? Because God did not send his son to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. And so our mission as ambassadors of Christ, as Paul refers to us in Corinthians, our mission is an ambassador to be a representative for him so that others might hear the story of how he saved us when we placed our faith and trust in him so that they too might turn, repent from their sins, place their trust in Christ, and have the same hope of eternal life that we have. So the next time you catch yourself wanting to condemn one of the world, you better take that finger and turn it around because Christ did not even come to condemn the world. There is a day that he's coming to judge the world. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But in this time, in this dispensation, if you will, it's our job, it's our calling to share Christ with others so that they too might enjoy the goodness of salvation in him. Then he goes on to say in verse, verse 18, whoever believes, whoever, whomever, meaning it doesn't exclude anyone, the vilest sinner, whoever believes, he said, and that word believes doesn't mean just cognitive, cognitively believe. James says that the demons believe the Son of God, yet they tremble. So it's not just believing that he was or believing that he existed. That word means to trust. Whoever believes, place their trust in what Christ did for them, is not condemned. You see, before we come to Christ, we are, we are condemned to an eternal damnation. But when we've placed our trust in Christ, we are no longer condemned. Behold, all things have passed away. All things have become new, Paul says. We've been created anew. We're not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already in their very state right now, in the state that you and I were before we trusted Christ. We were condemned. So for the one who does not believe in the only Son of God, and verse 19 says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. Now we've already seen earlier in John chapter 1, Jesus described as a light. The light has already come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. This morning when I went into the kitchen to make a cup of coffee, early in the morning it was dark, my wife is going to cringe when I say this, but I flipped on the light and there was one of those, it's not a roach, it's a, it's a pine, I call it a pine roach. They, they come in from the outside. They're the big guys. They're not the little food eating roaches, but, but there was this pine roach on the counter and I did clean it later with sanitizer, Sandy, just so you know. Uh, but the moment I turned on the light, that, that little, that big roach just scampered and began to run away. And I did get it and I put it outside. Um, but that's a great image of, of what he's saying here. 
when light comes, they, they, they refuse to come to the light for fear that their deeds would be evil. Um, they, they don't want to come to Christ. They don't want to face the righteousness. They don't want to face their own sinfulness because they enjoy wallowing and playing in their sin. They enjoy living their life on their own accord rather than submitting to the Lordship of Christ and a God who's created them for a purpose. And so they don't come because they're afraid their deeds should be exposed. Can I say this? Our deeds are already exposed, whether we realize it or not. Verse 21, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Pray today that God gives us an opportunity to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart. Reflect on your own story. Think about it today. Where were you when Christ saved you? Think on the fact that, that while you may not have participated in a lot of vile acts, ACTS acts, you were wretched and sinful, and that sin was in you. The potential for the most vile sin that you could ever imagine was in you. But Christ in his grace called you, drew you by the Holy Spirit, opened your eyes to see the truth of the gospel, gave you the faith to believe and to trust in Christ, and he saved you and transformed your life. Think on that. Praise God for that salvation. And then ask God to give you an opportunity to share that story with somebody else, to plant a seed of the gospel in their heart. If we recognize as we're going along in our day that someone has had a seed planted along the way, ask God to give you wisdom how to cultivate that seed and nurture that and grow that so that they might come to that place where they place their trust, where they believe in Christ Jesus and have the forgiveness of their sins, that God would allow us to watch somebody be saved by his grace today. Oh, that would be magnificent. Well, I pray the Lord blesses you and he keeps you, that his face would shine upon you. Remember, encourage the body today. Think of somebody, reach out, send them a text, place a phone call, encourage somebody in the body today. We're living in perilous times, and uh, but we don't need to walk in fear, but we need to walk in trust and faith in God and continue on with the mission that he's called us to in the midst of the circumstances we find ourselves in. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Have a great day.